whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. Well, good morning, church. Um, I'm absolutely honored uh, that I'd have this privilege to be able to bring God's word to you. Um, it's, it's bittersweet because I would love to be face to face, you know, as we all desire to be. Uh, but at the same time, for whatever reasons God, God has, He's determined that it would be this way for now. And we just, we trust in His sovereign hands and nonetheless, all the more cling to His word. And so I'm absolutely honored. And I pray that we would all grow as we come before His Word this morning. How about I pray and we'll see what He has for us today. Father, we honor You. For You are good and You do good. And Lord, this morning we thank You that even while we are physically apart, we are united in spirit. Hearts of one, of, co- of one accord, wanting to meet with you. We just pray that you'd speak to us clearly in your word. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to be more like Christ in all that we do. Not to us, Lord, but to your name. We lift up all praise. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, church, in the 19th century... In the 1830s, on the 20th of November, there was a a country at the time that was known as New Hebrides. And we know that now as Vanuatu. But during that century, about the 1830s, the first pair of formal missionaries traveled to this country to preach the gospel. And when they arrived, upon minutes, they were eaten, they were killed and eaten. And even so... The following gentleman, John G. Patton, took his wife, his child, and he traveled there to preach the gospel. Now, if you haven't thought of it already, you're probably wondering along with me, why on earth would John G. Patton, knowing what happened to the first pair of missionaries, even still go to preach the gospel, taking his wife and his child with him? It seems obvious that John had an extremely high view of the gospel and he gave his life to teach and protect the gospel and it should make us wonder why is the truth of the gospel so important to protect and what does it look like when it outworks itself in our lives individually and within the life of our church why do we need to protect the gospel And what does it look like in our lives? Now, last week we heard from our brother James and he taught us many things from this letter as we kicked off our study in the book of 1 Timothy. But I summed them up into two points from what we learned last week. Firstly, how Paul tells Timothy to command certain people not to teach anything else other than the true gospel of Christ. And secondly, that the goal of this command is rooted in and produces genuine love which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith now today we see Paul continue further into his encouragement to Timothy and we look at that in the next part of this letter and as we dive into this next section I want you to keep those two introductory questions that we came across a moment ago namely why Do we need to protect the simple truth of the gospel? And what does it look like in our lives as individuals, but more importantly, as the church, as we come together? And what that will look like in our time now is split up into three points as we dive into this passage. Firstly, it seems like Paul seeks to deepen deepen Timothy's understanding by placing himself firstly under the magnifying glass. He starts off, and that'll be our first point. He starts off by placing himself under the magnifying glass. And secondly, what we'll look at is, after that, Paul seems to express this desire to see it play itself out in the life of Timothy. That's the second thing we'll look at. And, and, and lastly, we'll see what Paul has to say 
as being the result of rejecting that which is most important. So three simple ideas. Paul places himself in, under the spotlight or in the spotlight under the magnifying glass and he has a desire to see the same love for the, of the gospel play out in Timothy's life and he talks about the result of rejecting that which is most important. But we'll start off with point number one. Brothers and sisters, the very next thing Paul does is he takes his own life and he puts himself under inspection. Have a look with me in verses 12 to 14 of this passage. Starting from verse number 12, he says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Now let me give you a brief rundown of the life of Paul. Because in, in one verse, he's tried to describe everything that he was to Timothy. And he's done that by giving us three words. A blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man. But this by no means is exhaustive. It doesn't cover everything about the life of Paul. But we've got more information in the book of Acts. And a brief rundown is this. The early church in the book of Acts, they started to grow. The gospel was spreading. Mass numbers in the thousands were coming to know Christ as Lord. And people around started to oppress them, to persecute the church. And the first person that we know of to die for the sake of the name of Jesus was a man named Stephen in the book of Acts, chapter 7. And the Bible tells us that the people around Stephen who heard his words when he was preaching the gospel, they wanted to kill him, essentially, because of what he was saying. And we're told that what they did, the witnesses of Stephen's acts, they took off their coats and they laid them at the feet of another person, not Stephen, but somebody else. And what this essentially was, was a, was a custom where they would lay their coats as, as a symbol of seeking the approval and consent to be able to go through with this punishment that they wanted to enact on the person. And lo and behold, we're told that they laid those, their coats at the feet of a man named Saul, who we now know as Paul. And we're told that Paul gave approval to murder this man by stoning him to death. This, this sums up the life of Paul. He breathed out threats of murder and he followed through with them. He tried to destroy the church, we're told, in the book of Acts. He went house to house, dragging out men and even more cowardly dragging out women, putting them in prison because of their faith. He traveled far and wide to persecute Christians. So much so that when we're told he came to Christ... The disciples themselves, after hearing this, they didn't believe it. They thought he was a liar. His reputation was, isn't this the guy that wreaked havoc on Jerusalem? This was the reputation of Paul. I mean, there's no wonder he starts off in verse 12, thanking Christ Jesus for entrusting him. The man was a murderer. Now in verse 13, he describes himself again as a blasphemer, somebody who puts down and speaks maliciously against the name of God, a persecutor and a violent man. And he was nothing short of this. Now church, we can lose sight of how great the grace of God is sometimes. We can do that. And how? I think within our world today, we often seek to elevate the status of man. We seek to lift ourselves up. We, we want to place ourselves at the center. We have a very human-centered way of viewing the world. But how dangerous it truly is when we ignore that outside of Jesus, we are dead in sin and that our hearts are filled with rebellion. It's confronting. I know, but it's necessary for us to understand. And there's a temptation there for us to fall into we can look at someone like Paul and we can we can say oh, well, I'm not that bad I didn't ravage the church I gave money to the church brothers and sisters if this was my reaction me Danny if this was my personal reaction to elevate myself and say I'm not that bad all this would show 
is that I truthfully do not understand how deep the roots of sin are ingrained within my nature. It's all that communicates. You see, the light of the gospel, the light of the gospel of Jesus loses its power and our need for it when we brighten the object it shines upon. When we fail to see the severity of our sinful nature, the gospel essentially loses its power and its need. We fail to see how serious our sin problem really is. And Paul knew that he would be a fool if he thought his heart was anything else less than the peak of darkness. He acted ignorantly, and that all came from an unbelieving heart. And Jesus himself said, it's not the healthy that need a doctor, it's the sick. I didn't come to call the righteous, I came to call sinners to repentance. Brothers and sisters, the most confronting yet necessary truth that we as people need to come to terms with is that outside of Christ, we're guilty, we're guilty before God. There was nothing Paul could do to save himself and there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. This is why we need the simple truth of the gospel. This is what it all comes down to. Let's have a look at verse number 14 and see what comes up. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Paul, a murdering man, and us too, dead in sin, if it not were for the grace and mercy of God, where would we be? Having received something that we don't deserve, the grace of God, having something taken away, the very thing we do deserve, the judgment of God being shown mercy, poured out abundantly on us in Christ Jesus. That's the heart of the gospel. And Paul says this was given freely, not because we deserve it, not because God is obliged, but because He's good. He chooses to do that. And we find faith and love, even the very faith that we come to Him with, He pours out abundantly on us. And He pours His love into our hearts through the promise of the Holy Spirit. So many blessings that come about through the gospel that we find in Christ Jesus. It reminds me of where I was before I came to know Christ. Steeped in sin, found by the grace of God, through no efforts of myself. And if we're all honest, we'd say the same thing alongside Paul. Saved by the grace and mercy of Jesus that we find in the gospel. And this leads Paul to make a sobering conclusion. A sobering conclusion and an outpouring of praise. And we too, having been captured by the grace of God, can say this alongside him. Let's have a look at verses 15 and 16. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. I mean, if anyone had reason to boast, it was Paul. Let me remind you of his credentials that he gives in the book of Philippians. He says, concerning the law, I was blameless, a Pharisee of Pharisees, a Hebrew from the tribe of Benjamin, if this doesn't humble us, that Paul, mind you, who wrote almost a third of the New Testament, if he himself humbly sits there and says, I'm such a sinner saved by grace, how much more should we? Paul understood this and he went to great lengths to communicate this to Timothy. And how foolish we would be to do anything other than worship the king in response I love verse 17. It's almost, I get this image in my mind where it's like a, a spring of water overflowing inevitably, bubbling over with praise. Let's look at verse 17 together. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. 
This is the response that springs forth from the heart of Paul. He can't help but praise God because he knows that he doesn't deserve Jesus, but Jesus chose to give himself to Paul. And when I think about this idea of responding in in praise and obedience, I'm reminded when I was preparing this sermon, I was reminded of a story about a month or two ago, we, we had baptisms uh, you know, from our church or with our church. And, and there were a few different people that were being baptized, but one of them specifically, a gentleman by the name of Simon Yako. Now, if you know Simon, you know he's, he's an amazing, amazing guy. Loves the Lord with all his heart, but he stands out in the crowd. He's, he's tall, built. You can spot him from the crowd. He's, he's a gentle giant though. And when he was being baptized, there's an image that was caught that was so beautiful that I think perfectly captures this idea. The image captured everyone's face right before they went under the water, right before they were submerged. And so you've got all these images of of people right before the water covers their face like a blanket. And then all of them have scrunched up faces because they're reacting to the water going up, you know, covering their face essentially. But Simon, in this photo, as the water is about to cover his face, he's just got a grin, a smile filled with joy from ear to ear. And when I saw that photo, I thought to myself, this ought to be the response of the believer. A serious joy, knowing that we've been passed from death to life through the gospel. May our hearts respond in the same way. And so that's point number one. Paul places himself under the magnifying glass so that he can show Timothy how much we need the gospel. And this leads us into our second point. When Paul expresses this this to Timothy, he seems to also demonstrate a desire for this to play out in the life life of Timothy as well. He wants to see this love for the gospel come forth in Timothy's life as well. Let's Use verse 16 as our springboard into verses 18 and 19. Remember verse 17 kind of acts as this uh, sort of interruption of praise. He just stops and he can't help but praise the Lord. And so he should. But we can use verse 16 and and continue that into verse 18. So I'm just going to jump from 16 to 18 so you can see the underlying thought that he's trying to communicate. He says in verse 16, But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. And we'll jump to 17 to verse 18. Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you so that by recalling them, you may fight the battle well. And just that first half of verse 19, holding on to faith and a good conscience. Now notice with me the assumption that Paul makes in verse 16. He seems to assume that a natural outworking of the gospel in his life is the displaying of the gospel in somebody else's life. In other words, When I cling and cleave to the gospel, when I love the gospel and the the power of the gospel changes my heart, changes my motives, my desires, that should naturally lead to me wanting to do that for somebody else. That should lead to me wanting to see somebody else love the gospel, be saved and changed by the gospel, being made more like Christ. And Paul wants that in the life of Timothy. And like a father to a son, with all sincerity and urgency, Paul commissions Timothy to understand what is at stake here. This is a matter of life and death. When someone comes to the cross of Jesus, having been forgiven of their sins, they pass from death to life, Jesus tells us. People's souls are at stake, and Paul knows that. Now in verse 18, let me give a brief word on this this idea of prophecies, because Paul mentions that. In verse 18, I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you. Now, we've got to be careful not to take any bad examples that we see in our day today and use that to define what Paul means here. We've got to be careful not to import any definitions 
any bad examples from our day to what Paul is saying. Prophecy throughout the scriptures in, in its most simplest form is speaking the words of God into the lives of his people. In its most simplest form, that's what it means. Now this might be a foretelling of something. You might speak of something that hasn't yet come, that will come to pass. It could be that. But more commonly, a specific word in a specific moment. Now the prophets in the Old Testament are good examples of this all through. They do both at different times. But it could also be what I'm doing now. More, when we, sorry, it could also be what I'm doing now. In a sense, I'm speaking to you prophetically. All I'm doing is speaking the truths of God as per His revealed word. And so there is a prophetic sense in which I'm speaking, not because I've got any special power or authority, it's because the words of God are being spoken to His people. And so in the context here, it's probably the case that Paul is reminding Timothy of the way the leaders in the church he was a part of, through the word of God, identified gifts in him that would set him apart as a leader. That's probably that what they were doing. And that's probably what Paul is referring to. Now all that to say, Paul is really simply trying to spiritually motivate Timothy to be faithful in advancing God's work. He's trying to motivate his heart. Look with me at how Paul describes this in verse 18 again. Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by recalling them, you may fight the battle well. Now, when, Tim, when Paul tells Timothy to fight the battle well, what does he mean by that? I mean, what battle is Timothy fighting? Well, I think the very next line that Paul dives into is, is what he means when he says, fight the battle well. He's probably, well, he says, holding on to faith and a good conscience. Now remember, this faith and a good conscience, as per the first half of the chapter, this is rooted in and it's produced from the truth of the gospel. Paul tells Timothy, don't let anybody teach anything else from the gospel because this is rooted in and produces genuine love which comes from a pure heart, a good conscience and a sincere faith. That's more than likely what he's referring to. This pure and truthful gospel and Paul describes it in these words that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. The lifeblood of the church is to know the gospel and teach the gospel and everything else flows from that. Remember that Paul and Timothy now have been separated for quite some time because when Paul first dropped off Timothy, there's probably been eight years or so from when he first left him in Ephesus as one of the pastors there to now when he's writing this letter. So they haven't seen each other for some time. And so out of all the things that he said, he writes this letter to Timothy on how to operate or how the church should operate. And he seeks to exclaim that at the center of this is the gospel of Christ. Hold to it, Timothy. And notice with me that he uses warfare, uh, notice that he uses warfare language. I wonder if we see it that way. Warfare language. It's an interesting way to describe it. The outworking of the church holding to the gospel is that sinners like myself and Paul and all those who come to know are saved by the blood of Jesus and they know Him as Lord and Savior. The outworking of the church holding to the gospel is that the sinners that have been saved are made more like Jesus as we walk with Him and as we walk together. The outworking of the gospel is that we are also preserved until our very last breath or when Christ returns. In other words, the truth of Jesus doesn't just save us, it sustains us. It empowers us to persevere. And in a word, if I can describe what Paul's trying to communicate to Timothy, he's talking about discipleship. A culture of discipleship within the church where you've got Members of the body seeking to build up other members through the gospel. Wanting to have people come to know Christ as a result of the gospel and therefore being sustained by the gospel. 
And then having a desire to see that person do that for somebody else, you've got this domino effect where people are speaking words of truth as per the gospel to each other so that we can all grow to be made like Christ. Church, our time together and the church of God as a whole needs nothing more than faithful men and faithful women who are going to hold to the gospel with a desire to see that played out in somebody else's life. That's what we need above everything else. No extravagant schedules and programs and entertaining and luring events. Just faithful men and women who love Jesus and love his word. And this leads into our last point. So we looked at Paul placing himself under the magnifying glass, showing our deadness in sin and the severity of our rebellion. And secondly, we looked at how through the gospel we're saved from that, but also how Paul has a desire to see that play out in the life of Timothy. And now Paul seems to communicate what the result is of rejecting that which is most important. And after pleading with Timothy to hold fast to teaching the gospel, he tells him why it's so important. Have a look with me in verse number 19. Holding on to faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and so have, and, and so have suffered shipwreck with regard to the faith. Now it begs the question, what have they rejected? What have they swerved into? Seems like they've swerved from holding to the gospel and they've been caught up in focusing on things that are almost right, but not quite. Close, but not quite there. This is why we have to be so careful because it's so subtle. It creeps into our conversations. And remember, he's, he's describing people that may be influenced by the outside of the church, but are seemingly within the church. He's talking about potentially people like me and you and, and all that's a part of the church. How easily and how prone we are to wander from what matters most. We need to make sure that all that we do serves to advance God's work. And rather than trying to give you an example of what that could look like in our day and age today, I mean, I'm sure we can come up with many examples. Paul gives a few in the beginning of the chapter. And you could probably ponder and start to reflect on what things we've been distracted by. You might want to do that with members of the church throughout the week. But let me give you in principle from the words of a man named Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was a minister in the 20th century from Wales. In principle, this is what I think would be very helpful, helpful for us to know. We have somehow got hold of the idea that error is only that which is outrageously wrong. So that error is only in the thing that is explicitly wrong, in other words. And he continues... And we do not seem to understand that the most dangerous person of all is the one who does not emphasize the right things. It's not just about not doing the things we shouldn't do, but it's about giving proper and appropriate attention to that which is most important. And remember that whoever Paul is talking to, they didn't influence the church to child sacrifice or something so abhorrent. They, didn't, he didn't, they weren't influencing them to do that. All they were doing is causing people to focus on areas and passages of Scripture that didn't ground them in the cross of Christ. And Paul says that as a result, in verse 20, let's have a look at verse 20. He says, Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, to be taught not to blaspheme. Now this idea of suffering shipwreck concerning the faith and being handed over to Satan, that they would be taught not to blaspheme, you should probably make some links to when we looked at the church maybe a term or two ago. And what we identified is within church discipline as per 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there's similar language. Paul talks that way giving them over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that their souls may be saved. He's talking 
to Timothy with regards to the church. So there's a similarity there. Now in the context of the church, this relates heavily back to church discipline. So let me draw out some helpful principles that I think uh, are related to this text when he uses that kind of language. Firstly, it's not condemning, rather it's corrective discipline. It's not condemning, it's corrective discipline. Paul's expressing this, wanting them to realize their fault because he loves them, because he cares for them. And he does this, this corrective discipline, in hopes that they will repent, in hopes that they will come back to the right way of thinking to reaffirm their place and their position in the household of God. And lastly, he does it in order to realign us, or realign them, I should say, in advancing God's work. Notice he says at the back end of verse 20, whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. He wants them to learn something. He wants them to grow from it. He wants them to change their ways. And Paul does this by commissioning Timothy to guard the gospel. Guard the gospel above all. But to finish off, let me give you three points of application that I think will be helpful for us to take hold of. Firstly, are we being convicted that we might be found amongst these people that Paul's trying to straighten up? Have we forgot our first love? Remember in the book of Revelation, Jesus talks to the very same church of Ephesus and he says, you've forgotten your first love. You've forgotten that which matters most. I wonder if we find ourselves there. And secondly, in and amongst all of the things that we're doing, whether we're watching the footy, chatting when we meet, or even going shopping, all these things, not wrong in and of themselves, they're good and they're perfectly fine. But while we're engaging in all those things, in our heart of hearts, in the bottom of our souls, do we desire that people would come to know Christ through those experiences and interactions? Do we desire that whoever it is we're talking to, probably a member of the church, would be drawn more to have Christ formed in them as they're being made more like Jesus? Is that the heart behind all that we do? It seems like Paul wants Timothy to have that in mind as he guards the gospel within the church. The simple truth of the gospel is what leads us to Jesus so that we can be saved by faith in Him and as a result, become effective servants of Christ so that we can see other people so too walk with Jesus. You remember at the beginning of the sermon, I started off with a story with John G. Patton, the man who went to Vanuatu and preached the gospel there. Well, less than 50 years after the first two missionaries were murdered, John Patton wrote this down. He said, King Jesus, quote, told the whole Christian world that he claimed these islands as his own. The people of Vanuatu in the 1830s were dead in their sins. They ate the flesh of their enemies. They committed great crimes against children. They even killed the widows upon the deaths of husbands. This very island came to Christ. And today, roughly 85% of the population of this island still profess the name of Jesus. And that is exactly why we need to love, treasure, preach, protect, and hold to the gospel. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your gospel. Thank you for the saving work of Jesus through the cross of Calvary. Thank you that we have our sins forgiven in Jesus. We thank you that you are good and you do good. We just pray that you'd help us to love your word, to love your gospel, to hold on to it with all that we have. For we pray this in the very name that saves us, in Jesus' name. Amen.